Hello, uh, my name is Anthony Tremaine and I was the composer on Vocalab Productions' Doctor Who, The Last Days Before Dawn. And I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to have a chat about the, the process and what it was like working with the guys. When Craig first got in touch with me and asked me about scoring this, this fan audio series he'd written of Doctor Who, I absolutely I jumped at the opportunity straight away because I'd worked with Craig once before years ago um, it, unfortunately the, the project was never finished um, but I did I remember I'd written a fair few pieces of music for him but they were absolutely dreadful because I'd written them on a very old sounding keyboard absolutely atrocious <laughs> so, somewhere along the way the, the files themselves have, have, have disappeared thankfully so when I naturally when he asked me to work with him again I, well yeah straight off off we go you know what do you need me to do luckily i didn't have the pressure of having to adapt the main theme uh he'd already picked a cover version off the internet for that which is thankful because i know how protective and how picky craig is <laughs> over the main theme so i didn't have that pressure at least and so he you know he he, he sent me the trailer and the script to have a listen and a read of and when I listened to the trailer, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I may not be able to alter the terrors that will come in the next few months, but I can help you. You've done enough. Every time you try and help me, you end up making my life even more of a misery than it already is. I, I could not believe what I was listening to. You know, this was... This sounded like something Big Finish would have done. It didn't sound like a fan-made production at all. And I mean, Chris and, and Lauren's performances as well, just in the trailer alone, made me think it was Maisie Williams and Peter Capaldi. There were no two ways about it. Um, and then I had to listen to the script, uh, had a read of the script, sorry. Uh, and I, I was absolutely just gobsmacked at what I was reading because it sounded like just perfect Doctor Who. You know, it was, it was the perfect Doctor Who story. So anyway, a little bit of time passed uh, and he sent me the first scene to score, which is the first time the Doctor and a Shielder meet in this episode anyway. And I'm, I must have sat there listening just purely to the scene on its own for ages because it sounded like Maisie Williams and Capaldi, you know, and the acting was absolutely just astounding. And to what do I owe the privilege, good sir? Enough with the sarcasm. I'm here to help. You've helped enough. I saved your life. I had a moment of weakness. And yet, your weakness is my downfall. And I sat there and eventually started scoring something. <laughs> Which is where the, the four-note um, sort of sorrow theme was written, which you'll hear throughout the episode. But then there was also uh, whoever played Mary uh, in the opening scene was just incredible because she, her voice acting was that convincing that when I was trying to score the piece where the part where she's dragged off, I found it almost uncomfortable to listen to because it legitimately sounded like a child being dragged off to be drowned, you know? And it was, it was very uncomfortable to listen to and, and score. I had to listen to that bit over and over again, so it was, it was you know, as you can imagine, a bit, uh, a little, got, got, a, got a little bit, little bit to the nerves that one. Please don't let them take me. Please, the shielder, the shielder, the shielder, the shielder. <laughs> the process uh, that we had for scoring uh, was quite a simple one, really. There wasn't much to it. Um, I would receive an email off Craig with the scene he wanted music for. I would then take that and listen to it in full on its own to begin with. Uh, and then just start listening to it in bits and dribs and drabs and start slowly but surely building up something, uh, some sort of bass score, and then building on that from there. 
a lot of the time I didn't score the scenes in order. You know, sometimes I'd think of something but halfway through the scene and score that. Like for example, the medicine woman, I think I scored the end from when a shield is talking about Mary first and then everything else before that came came afterwards. But when uh, I, I was done with that, I would then send Craig a version of the scene with the dialogue very quietly underneath. So he had a reference as to where the music started and stopped. Uh, and then obviously the track with eight, the music, and he would have a listen. And if it worked, fine. I mean, I think... Out of all 13 tracks I wrote, we only ever actually had one where he needed me to uh, to redo part of it. But the rest of it was we never really had many problems with, which was good. <laughs> made for a nice, easy process. One of my more prouder moments in this score is the uh, the theme of the angels, which slowly changes as they slowly reveal their identities and their motives become more clear. I mean, to begin with, it starts off with that simple motif. I mean, I wrote it, I mean, it's just a simple, it's just nine notes. But I wanted to write a theme for them that even before you heard their voices, if you heard the music first, you knew that it was them. You knew straight away that trouble was afoot. And it started off to begin with just cellos, double bass, and a male voice choir. Um, and then with some really horrible sounding synthesizer underneath it. And then I added some high strings on at a point where two notes are just being repeated um, of the main motif. So, that, you know, you'd have the main nine notes to begin with, and then two of those notes were just repeated and the strings would come in. That was the first time you hear them. The second time, I changed the theme only slightly, just just enough that it wasn't massive, so I didn't want people to go, oh, God, that's, that's different, but just subtly changed, so that maybe you'd notice it, but you wouldn't notice it if you weren't listening for it, kind of thing, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> but it was, um, I, I um, took it and I changed the vowel sound that the male voice choir was singing, so it was an R ah instead of an R ah sound. took out the high strings, but left everything else in. So it's subtly different, but not massively enough to warrant you to go, ooh, hang on. The third time round is when it really changes. Um, and that's when the angels reveal their true identities. Uh, and that just starts off with the cellos playing the nine notes. Then it kicks in, you know, almost like a completely different track. Because when they've revealed their identities, the music changes as well. So you've got the, the nine notes now being played by a French horn instead with some choppy staccato strings underneath, some percussion and some higher strings kick in a bit later. And then the phrase where, where the, just the two notes are being played is now on an organ instead underneath uh, an extra little motif that I wrote on top. And that was one of my, you know, I was, I was really quite proud of that theme because, it, like I said, it, it just evolved with the characters. And I think it was a perfect example of, of how I wanted the score to evolve. One of my favourite parts working on the score, sorry, the, the best part of working on the score, uh, was actually working with Craig. He is such an easy guy to get on with. It's untrue. And he's understanding as well. Uh, and he knows exactly what he wants. And I think throughout the process of working on The Last Days Before Dawn, we built up such a good professional working relationship. Nine times out of ten, he just gave me free roam of the scenes. But sometimes if he said he wanted something specific, like the guitar slide in Witch Hunt, then I would go, OK, take that away, think about it, and try and incorporate what he wanted. And as I mentioned earlier, we only ever had one moment out of the whole two months we were working on the score um, where he turned around and said that something didn't quite work, and that was fine. Yeah, that was during, uh, I think it was the track I found a clue, and there was a section that didn't quite work, so I deleted it, changed it, and left your synthesizers in there. And he, you know, he was fine with that. and. He's, like I said, he's very understanding. The amount of times uh, he gave me deadlines. Like, originally, the episode was going to be released in October. 
uh, and it looked like it was going towards the end, like early November. And unfortunately, due to time constraints and fitting it in in between my own personal life as well, it, it wasn't ready on time, so he pushed it back. And there was a, occasions where he, I think he announced the release date on Facebook. And I thought, oh, God, you know, I haven't, there's still five scenes left to record and I haven't had the, the scenes yet. And, you know, I just said to him, I don't think I can do it. And he was like, oh, no, that's fine. Don't worry about it. And pushed the date back, you know. Um, and I think that's why when I wrote the trial, all nine minutes of it were done in an evening and a half because... He sent it me on the Tuesday. It was sent to me so late because I think he'd had to wait for some voice actors to come along. And he sent it me on the Tuesday. I couldn't work on it that night. But the Wednesday night, I was up until, I think, you know, early hours scoring it, making sure it was, you know, as good as I could get it. And the next evening, when it was due to be released, <laughs> I sat there. The Thursday that episode was released, I was still touching up in the final touches on, on the trial and touching it up here and there to make sure everything was perfect. Um, sent it across and I sat there and the 30 seconds it took for him to respond was the longest because I was thinking, oh my God, you know, if this is... Because it had a good man in there and I wanted to make sure it was perfect for him and it was fine. You know, I thought if there's any changes that he'd do and he needs to tell me now so I can go and do them, but he didn't need any. And the episode was released about an hour or so later. You know, and he really is... I mean, he knows what he wants. He's got such a creative mind and he will... He will tell you if you're struggling. He will tell you and help you out. And I mean, he, when he wanted me to put a good man, uh, an excerpt from that into the trial, he was trying to describe to me which bits he wanted, and I wasn't quite understanding it because we were talking through via texts and what have you. So it was a little difficult to explain it. So what he did, he he went away and came back with a cut down version of a good man with the bits that he wanted in there with the episodes underneath it so I knew you know which where to put it and it made it so much easier because that, that way I could take it away and I could learn it record it put it in the episode and it was fine you know which made the recording scoring process so much easier if you have a director or a writer who knows what they want then you know you're on to a win overall this process has been fantastic the two months I spent writing the music was you know absolutely fantastic it really was i thoroughly enjoyed it you know craig and kimberly's script as i said was utterly brilliant the cast made it so much easier for me to unleash this <laughs> this this emotional score onto the episode and i really do wish them all all the best and any all, all the guys at vocal lab productions all, all the best for the future which you know i have already been signed on for it's been a pleasure you know it really has and i look forward to working with them in the future and, and any other projects they just happen to throw my way to write the music for you know if you haven't already listened to the episode then please do go on on the soundcloud for vocal lab productions or their youtube channel uh, and if you wish to listen to the soundtrack if you go on my if you go onto soundcloud and search for anthony tremaine then you will find the entire soundtrack there ready and waiting for you to listen to so feel free and uh, keep an eye on any updates on facebook or any other sort of social media for uh, any of their future products it's been a pleasure talking to you i hope i haven't bored you and uh, please do enjoy <laughs>